don't be afraid to do new things and constantly be challenged. And don't be afraid to be unconventional. I know we teach, everything we do is about being conventional. I'd love to see a book out there someday that didn't have an index. You know, you just read it. I, you don't need to tell me what the chapters are. I mean, who buys a book and then goes right to chapter six just because that title, uh, subtitle was interesting. Episode 144. This is The Business of Architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, you're missing out on the valuable, free, practice-building resources I share only via email. Getting on the list is simple. Visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the green Join Today button. I am your host, Enoch Sears. To get more profit or efficiency in your firm, check out this business tip from Peter Drucker. What's measured improves. Now, I found this to be so true, and as a firm owner, you must be tracking your financial key performance indicators. One of the easiest ways to do this is with a software application like ArchiOffice. Get a live walkthrough of the software by visiting ArchiOffice.com demo, and a big thank you to ArchiOffice for supporting this show. Our guest today is the business development manager at AB Design Studio based in Santa Barbara, California. And on today's episode, you'll discover the number one key to succeeding even when the competition is fierce. How our guest manages 1,900 plus relationships like clockwork. The high performer's secret to starting every day with power and success. Do you have a limited time to focus on marketing and business development? If so, you'll want to focus on this. And if you don't want to be mediocre, here's one tip to guarantee you grow personally and professionally every single day of your life. And with that, here's the second part of my interview with Ariana Leopard, the business development manager at AB Design Studio. Well, Ariana, let's so 1,900 people in your Rolodex. The math isn't really adding up here. Maybe it does. Uh, <laughs> twice, tw so there's. You know, basically, I just did some quick numbers. I guess 22 minutes, I think, if I did my math right. If you if you called every person, you'd have 22 minutes to devote to them if you have 1,900 people in your in your address book, if you did it full time. So tell me a little bit more about, you know, you said two times a month, that would be 11 minutes per person. Are you, are you, are you doing anything else besides calling people? Oh, yeah, I'll do a, a text message, uh, you, you know, sort of the beneficial aspect of the advent of technology you know the internet is not tv right it's an interesting platform it's you know it's mail without postage you can send it out without limits almost at this point so between i use gchat imessage slack podio i mean i have about 10 different communication apps on my phone and all of those help facilitate relationships and they can, some people get a call, you know, some people don't want to call. They're busy, right? I have plenty of executives who love texting. You know, it's, I just wanted to see how you're, how you're doing, what you need. Uh, how's your weekend? You know, I mean, the holiday season, it's like, you know, how do I reach out and say happy holidays without doing just a Instagram blast and uh, hoping people see it? So there's different ways, you know, not everybody does a call. But uh, I run every morning, and I actually do calls while I run. I do calls when I drive. You know, part of it is I don't have office hours. I don't have a. I do all my work between nine and five. So, how about how about any C, C, Do you have any suggestions for CRM platforms? I know there's a lot of them out there. Is there any that you use to organize your contacts? Because that can be a challenge. You know, I've used Salesforce, which I think is effective. Uh, we are using Podio right now, and we're still tweaking. Uh, Podio seems to be sort of garbage in and garbage out, and you have to customize your CRM. I am a big advocate, you know, when people ask, you know, social media and marketing. I, I like LinkedIn. Honestly, I think it's one of the most valuable tools for connecting. You know, uh, Instagram and Facebook, you just throw it out there. But uh, you can export your LinkedIn contacts. You can look them up by category. I can export, uh, you know, anyone who has a director of facilities or director of real estate title. And so I can kind of manage those conversations, you know, okay, who do I need to talk to and what role? You know, you can 
look up everybody by just editors. Um, it's an it's a interesting kind of multi-face platform for contacts. Now, some people, you know, add everybody under the sun and they don't filter and they've never met half the people. Part of it is managing the quality of the relationships. And so when I want to look up somebody, I have exported my LinkedIn into my uh, eye contacts and I have them divided by who they are. And then, uh, you know, you can import that into whatever CRM that you're doing and then just do the follow up, you know, last contact, you know, next contact, what kind of contact they prefer. That's a really key component that I've customized on our CRM is what the preferred method of contact is. Some people are very busy. Everybody's very busy, right? And some people don't want to call. Some people, uh, on Monday or Tuesday, actually, uh, I was in a executive business forum and my phone died walking into the, the forum at 8 a.m. I didn't turn it on until 5. And another colleague of mine, uh, we went and grabbed dinner after and he said, you know, your phone's been off for you know, 8 to 5. How many emails do you have? And I said, I have 18 Slack messages. Uh, about eight or text messages and 296 emails. And just one day of having my phone off. And so you have to figure out how to manage it, right? And part of it is I, the mailboxes. So it's not just CRM, but you know who goes where and which attention. So I have emails going automatically, depending on who they're from, into certain boxes. So I know some people can hold off on two hours to be contacted. I have certain clients that they get a contact immediately. As soon as they email, they're the first to get a response. But, you know, I, uh, it's hard advice to give because everybody uses it in a slightly different way. You know, people track leads differently. I really want to know the, the percentage of how many leads have become deals. I don't want to just know I have 60 deals and 100 leads. You know, I want to know actually how many of those converted in one amount of time because the conversion has the cost associated with it. How many hours did it take, you know, in communicating, networking, taking them out to become that? And how could we streamline our efficiency? So it depends on how you're tracking it. How do you track your conversion? Do you do that in Podio as well? I know they do have a sales pipeline feature. Mm -hmm. Is that what you we use? Do. Yes. And then I just... Uh, you can customize the template. So I've been able to add different widgets of, you know, it's sort of generically set up as when you first contacted them and you last contacted them and your next follow-up, which to me doesn't provide any information really. And so we created kind of a communication log. We were able to track exactly what was discussed and when, how long each meeting, you know, was with the timestamps and whatnot. And then you can create a report and show sort of, okay, like it took 15 hours from the beginning of negotiating this project to, you know, we're finally billable. We're finally in contract with them. And then, you know, that's kind of a tool that I want to go back and discuss with the team of like, okay, how do we get it to seven hours? Because I don't know many people that come to an architect who, and they just, let's, let's have a meeting, but let's hold off for a year. You know, they really, everybody wants to move in sync. So I want to be able to know how to be the most effective for my clients as well. Yep. Do you have any tools? How do you manage the, so when you contact, say you contacted someone a month ago, if you're managing multiple contacts, say a hundred, you know, it, it's easy to lose some of those people in the shuffle. What process do you have, Ariana, for remembering when it's time to reach out to someone or making sure that someone doesn't slip through the cracks. Do you have any automated system that does that or using a manual process to make sure that people get a certain amount of touches over a certain amount of time? I actually have a system set up on my phone, uh, just basically an alert. And every morning I wake up and at seven, there's a list that I've created. Uh, basically, um, in Podio, you can create a system. It's all about filters, right? So you can filter it a million different ways of, you know, who I need to contact this week, who I need to contact in the next two weeks, who I need to contact today. You know, you can filter it, set it up however you want. But everybody that's set up like, you know, today is the 15th. I wake up and there's an email with a list of everyone I need to contact. So I never wait to get to the office to check my emails and get going. Uh, my alarm goes off at five. 
and I have a process that I do every morning. I write every morning. I meditate. I have my coffee. Like I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm very set in my ways. And then I have this list that says, you know, here's 20 people that need to be reached out to today. And when they were last contacted and like one sentence of what you spoke about last time, and I can always log back in to the system. That's what's nice is all you need is a name and then you can get your entire communication log. But so I have my list. Sometimes it's only two people per day. Sometimes it's 30. But to wake up and kind of have that list of, okay, these are the people I need to, to reach out to. But, you know, a huge part of this, it's easy to say, but you have to clean up your system. You have to be diligent. A lot of people go, okay, I, you know, I need to talk to Ariana. Um, I'll put it on the list later. And I carry my phone with me all the time. I take my notes on my phone. I don't write it and then type it. To me, that's a delay in the process. So the moment I know, you know what, I need to call this person, I put it on my list right now and it goes into the system and then it's all automated. I think part of it is when there's a delay in I need to do something, to me everything needs to be done now. Everything to me is in a state of urgency. But if you can clean up your system, that's the biggest thing. You ask what's the best CRM, there's a lot of them. But if you're not diligent, if you're not persistent, if you're not meticulous with entering information, it's going to be a useless platform regardless. Ariana, something we haven't ever, I haven't touched on on the show yet is the morning routine. You brought it up. Uh -huh. And I think that would be an excellent thing to just touch on, to talk about your morning routine. I have a very structured morning routine and it's something that's helped me in my life just enormously. You gave us a little peek into your morning routine. Can you give us a little bit more in depth? What, what are the steps that you go through? when you get up and get ready for the day? Well, uh, so a, a little sort of backstory. Uh, when I was in the Bay Area, I raced bikes competitively. So I've never had time as an adult. I've never just had copious amounts of free time. So I knew I had to be very careful in the morning of what I needed to do to find balance. You know, I had a, a 30 mile bike ride every morning before work. And then I had training after work. And it sort of created a, a good plan platform and foundation for, oh, you know what, I need to do these things to have clarity. So, and I think it's very effective for executives. Um, if you, you can read interviews, you know, everyone's like my, you know, the seven highly effective habits for, you know, the top producing people in our society. And I think most people always just assume there's, they're too busy. I do wake up very early. I have seen the sun sunrise every single day, but I think um, you need to have your morning routine be a practice that you hold as the same value as a meeting with a high priority client. So I wake up and I check my email first. I know some people say don't ever do that, but to me I need to know kind of what's happening for the day. And then I go for a run. I have everything timed. I mean, it, it is really militant in many ways. I enjoy reading the news in bed. Um, Last January, I had a commitment for my resolution that I would write every morning for 30 minutes and I would read for 30 minutes a book. Uh, you know, it's this crazy thing. It's this 3D Kindle. You know, it's a book. No one reads a book anymore. And I actually read every morning and write. And to me, that is how I create a sense of balance for the entire day. If I can't do that, I found I got burnt out by noon. And I was drinking too much coffee. I, I wasn't eating well. You know, there's all these things that kind of snowball. And I think everybody, me, and the, part of the thing is it becomes automated, right? A habit is just an action that you've taken enough times that over a certain period, it just, that's what you do. I just, I wake up without an alarm, which is not everyone can do that, but it's a great feeling to actually just wake up and know you're not rushed. I have one set just in case, but to kind of go through those actions and feel ready when you actually walk into the door at the office, I think is very important. Some people walk in blind and, or they walk, they start their day blind. And I know like every morning I do these things. I eat the same thing. You know, I just, that's part of just the routine and knowing what you what need to eat. What do you eat? I'm just curious. I eat, uh, so I have, a, I have a triple espresso. And I eat granola. My mom, I love my mom. She makes me homemade granola. So I have oh, granola and yogurt sounds, sounds every amazing. morning. 
every single morning I have the same thing. And you know, there's a lot of people, uh, Seth Godin actually spoke about this in a, a conference I went to. He has, I think it was a shake, some banana smoothie. He's had every, every day for 15 years. <laughs> people go, why? And he goes, why not? Like, this is my, this is my routine. Love it. So, you know, find what makes you the most effective and make those habits, communicate that that's necessary for you to be functioning at the highest level and communicate that to other people. And, you know, on the weekends, you know, if someone goes, you know, I really just want to sleep in and then go for a brunch at 10. I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, even on the weekends, I have my same routine that I do Monday through Friday. I love it. I think that's a real important success tip. So I'm glad we were able to get into that just about, uh, you know, peak in the mind of high performers. I know that, well, I find like Seth Godin, you know, it, it does take mental energy. I don't know if this may sound silly, if you've experienced this as well, but choosing what to eat for breakfast takes mental energy. And I found that I like to be a cognitive miser. I like to reserve my brain power for things that actually matter. So when it comes time to breakfast, I don't want to think about it. I want to down my smoothie, whatever I'm eating, and then just get on with the day. Maybe there's something to that. Maybe not. Well, you know, Steve Jobs talked about his uniform, you know, wearing his black turtleneck every day. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm the most creative in the morning, the most energized in the morning. And it caused him a great deal of stress to have to worry about what to wear. So this was his uniform, you know, and there's a, there's a lot of, ideas about why architects more or less wear all black. I mean, we do. And uh, a lot of us. And, you know, part of it is not distracting the client with our, you know, design preference, you know, part of it, you know, letting the art speak for itself. You know, there's all these different things. I just like that. I don't have to worry. I can grab pretty much anything in my closet in the pitch dark and it looks okay together. <laughs> so to me, it's kind of, what we call in architecture, the client and our, kind of our initial due diligence meetings, it's value engineering, right? What's important and what's not? Where can I cut corners or where do I need to keep the integrity? For me, I learned sort of what I don't need to worry about, I can automate in some ways. I mean, that's what you're doing when you're talking about CRM and having automatic reminders and all this. We could do that with all aspects of our life. You know, I don't... Uh, I feel like my memory is kind of, you know, the computer's uh, disk full message that it always blinks at me every day that I have too much on there, you know, delete. One thing comes in, something has to go out. So the less that I have to remember, the less that I have to take action on for myself, uh, then I'll do it. And part of it is just every weekend, I take my mom to lunch every Saturday. We watch a design show and she makes me homemade granola. Like that's just what she does. And that's what I have for the week. So have it planned, know your practices, hold your practices. If you're not going to be committed to them, they're not going to be effective. So the 80-20 the principle says that for everything you do in your life, you know, 20% is going to give you 80% of your results and vice versa. 80% will give you 20%. So sometimes it's called the, the law of the vital few and the trivial many. You know, so say, for instance, if you have 100 clients, you may have 20 of them who produce the most revenue are the most enjoyable to work with. And then the other 80% will, you know, produce 20% of the revenue. Ariana, what I'd like to ask you is if you're talking to a, a sole practicing architect or someone who has a small firm, they can't afford to bring in a business development marketing person, but they do want to grow their firm and they do want to make those connections. What would you say would be the 20%, the priority with limited amount of time to focus on? Because they don't have all day to to call up contacts. They don't have all day to go out there and network necessarily. They might want to get to that point. But if they do have limited time, where would you say they would be best off putting their efforts? You know, that goes back to kind of the internet of things and the possibility that you have with the least cost, right? It is costly to go out there. It's time consuming. I don't have kids, so I can do that at night. A lot of people can't. That's part of it. They have to be home sort of around six. I think uh, LinkedIn is valuable for initial conversations. Um, I like the press. You know, a long time ago, I interned uh, as a press officer at the Department of Justice. In the, and it was great because you learn the value of the press. And I would call, a, you know, your local, if you want to be a local architect, I mean, I assume you can't do certain projects, you know, across the country, if you're a sole practitioner, call 
the local paper and say, hey, I'd really like to do a feature piece. And this is me, you know, I've had lots of success doing marketing projects on the side for other firms uh, be before AB. And I set up, you know, I facilitated an article on them. And, you know, within a week, people called and said, hey, I, you know, I'd love you to design my winery. I'd love you to do this. So it's just getting yourself out there to your audience. It's not touching every person, you know, turning a suspect into a lead, into a deal and being aggressive. You know, part of it is just getting your name and your brand out there. So if you're by yourself, I think that's one of the most effective things. Communities rally around their members. You know, I, I think more or less, I don't know any community that goes, you know, I'm just going to let someone flail out there by themselves. I mean, that's the whole concept. Santa Barbara is very tight in many ways. So I would, you know, that's one, definitely one option. Um, introductions. Don't be afraid to ask people that you respect to make an introduction. Uh, I, there's a, a great architect in town and his wife is a, a phenomenal lighting designer. And I call them kind of my architect parents. And they, we went to dinner and they brought another female architect who was my age from a very prestigious firm here in town. And we all went to dinner and they literally, my design parents, set me up on a play date with another architect because they thought it would be beneficial and I need to meet other females. That's, I mean, another thing, there's not many of us out there in architecture. So, you know, just to reach out and say, hey, I'd like to meet new people, who do you know? That didn't cost, it didn't take much time. It was a request. They could have declined it. They can accept it. But it was very nice of them to set up that dinner and bring someone that they thought would be beneficial. And I think just the power of asking your networks, right? You have someone that you trust. Why not have them extend their network of trust and kind of bring you into it? Ariana, where are you learning from right now in terms of your virtual mentors, uh, books, people you look to, thought leaders? Where are you getting your learning and growth right now in your personal life and professional life? A few places. Uh, I took business courses from an organization called the Aji Network in the Bay Area, which is a competitive le executive leadership kind of business development sales strategy course. I, uh, the founder trained under Fernando uh, Flores, who was the Chilean finance minister. And so that was a very interesting program. I am also recently part of a group called Vistage here in Santa Barbara which is an executive leadership forum. Basically, they put us in a room with 15 other business leaders in the community, and we kind of discuss challenges, opportunities, and we help one another. You know, someone might have a problem with an employee or they want to increase their marketing capacity, and we help one another. And I think it's a very valuable tool that once a month for between eight and five, you get together with other leaders in your community, and it's a vault. Nothing that you know that you say in there ever leaves the room, so it's facilitated trust in many ways. I mean, it's hard to go into a room and just tell your secrets to people, but I think that's been very valuable. And like I said, you know, everyone needs a mentor. I don't think you're ever too old to have one. And mine from RTKL has been phenomenal in reviewing print collateral. You know, when I redo something, I'm like, what do you think about this? You know, based on the size of deals he does and what I would, I aspire to do, you know, he could say, you know what, a guy trying to build a $150 million hotel really doesn't want to see so much text. I'm like, great. Um, I think everybody needs someone to have a conversation with. And so you can do a business class, you can read books, but I think really our value comes from other people. So find people you respect. And even like forums online, you know, this is why I think the business of architecture is so helpful is, you know, you listen to something interesting, you go, you know what, that was, that was interesting. The insight was helpful. I'd like, to, I'd like to know more. And then I will just Google that person and then email or call them say, can we Skype? Can we start, you know, an email conversation? Can we create a virtual relationship? Can we meet in person for lunch? That's what I do in grad school. I would read a book. And if I found it interesting, 
or impactful in any way, I would look up where they were lecturing. I would email them. I would ask them more, you know, are you doing a, a second version of this? Or has your thesis changed over the years? You wrote it in 99, it's 2011. So part of it is, you know, just looking for things that inspire and then connecting with those people. Ariane, it's, it's been great to have you on Business of Architecture. I'm glad that you have listened to the show, found it, found it profitable, enjoyable for you, and that you're now a guest on the show. Just to finish up here, is there any question that you feel I should have asked that I didn't? For instance, is there something in the back of your head? You said, you know what? I have this asset. I've done this, and this has been really powerful for me. Enoch didn't ask me about that. I wish he would have because that's something that I could really, some value I could have shared or given. Does anything come to mind in terms of uh, questions that my audience might get value out of that I didn't ask about you or your background? You know, I have a very unusual background, and I think it's it's sort of a, a millennial challenge. You know, people look at uh, our resumes and they go, wow, you've, you've moved around a lot or you've done this, and there's no pension, there's no security for sort of the younger generation. We didn't grow up knowing that we'd be at one firm for 20 years and then we'd go to another firm for 20 years and then we would retire. So, you know, one thing is, you know, how do you, how do you sort of navigate what you do? And for me, it's always about finding possibilities and converting those to opportunities. So, you know, how do you stay fresh in the market? How do you stay relevant? I think relevancy is an interesting question that nobody asks about. And part of it is, you know, don't, don't be afraid to do new things and constantly be challenged. And don't be afraid to be unconventional. I know we teach, everything we do is about being conventional. I'd love to see a book out there someday that didn't have an index. You know, you just read it. I, you don't need to tell me what the chapters are. I mean, who buys a book and then goes right to chapter six just because that title subtitle was interesting interesting i i have a, a mentor and friend of mine who does he does six week challenges to sort of put him out of his comfort zone in terms of you said always learning always growing doing new things you know sometimes we need things to challenge us to get us out of our comfort zones do you have any any routines or any techniques or any that you do personally to stay relevant and to make sure that you're always walking on the curb i actually wake up every day and choose one thing that I know is going to make me uncomfortable, and then I do it every day. Um, it could be I'm going to go to a difficult yoga class. I'm going to read a book that's not in the genre that I normally uh, do. I'm going to go do karaoke because I have a horrible voice and no rhythm, but you know something. I'm going to go to a boot camp. I'm going to go with a group of um, you know, psalms and be way out of my league. Every day I do something I know is a little bit of poison, but will make me stronger in the long run. You sort of need that anti-fragile, if that makes sense, to do something that's slightly dangerous and, you know, unconventional, a little bit of that toxin, but will overall build our immunity in some way. And I think if you're going to stay relevant, you need to be one, okay with failure. You know, it's not failure doesn't mean it's the end of the game. It means you get to just try again. You can always pass go over and over. And for me, the most dreadful thing I can think of is being mediocre or being uninteresting with myself. And part of business development, meeting new people, having clients take an interest in you you know, you're selling the brand of your firm, but you're really selling yourself as well. And I think if you're not comfortable challenging yourself and where you stand, if you don't have an opinion about what you do, you're going to kind of walk on the side of being irrelevant quicker. I love it. Thank you, Ariana, for joining us on Business of Architecture. Thank you for dropping some value bombs there for our listeners. Yes, thank you. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, 
and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.